Here's a question you may have never considered. Why do we dream? All of us have had a dream at some point in our lives. Some dreams are amazing, some are frightening, and some are a little bit, well, you know what you into, freaky thing. Dreams have been associated with everything from our subconscious to even communicating with those that have passed on. You would think that something that some people do every night would be understood by now, but dreams continue to be a fascinating and mystifying experience for each of us. So let's take a deep dive into these nightly visions, a dream quest if you will, to understand why we dream and what would happen if we didn't. Imagine living in the ancient world at a time when we didn't know what our brains were and we didn't have modern science to investigate or explain why our minds dream at night. Dreams can feel every bit as rich and vivid as the real world. Without knowing what the brain can construct such as images, sounds, and even tactile sensations, centuries ago people only had two explanations for why we dream. Either our dreams are divinely created or they're real in and of themselves. And because these experiences are so profound, the dividing line between the real world and the dream world was blurred to many ancient societies. They actually fed into each other. For some people, it meant that it was a gateway into the immaterial world. To others, it meant that the dream world was a literal place, a world where we could go at night when we all sleep. A place that's as physical and real as the one we're in now. A Chinese philosopher named Shuangzi, who lived from 369 BC until 286 BC, gave the most famous observation about how the dividing line between reality and dream worlds could be blurred to ancient cultures. He said, and of course I'm paraphrasing here because my ancient classic Chinese is a little rusty, that if you dream of being a butterfly every night, soon you'll not know if you're a human dreaming about being a butterfly or a a butterfly dreaming about being a human. In other words, you can't know what's truly real because dreams just seem as vivid as real life, at least while you're having them. Right now, you could just as well be on a dinosaur dreaming about being a person watching Matthew Santoro on the internet. <laughs> okay, well, maybe not. But the point is, dreams are so powerful in our lives that ancient peoples had no problem but to see them as something mystical and otherworldly. Incidentally, there's no known solution to Zhuangzi's butterfly conundrum. There's no way of telling if you're currently awake or dreaming. Kind of like Inception. Oops, spoilers. Come on, man, get to that film. It's been out for ages. Our explanations for why we dream are currently based on modern science, but we still hang on to profound ideas from the ancients even today. Let me ask you, have you ever dreamed of someone you haven't seen for ages and then randomly bumped into them soon after? Or has a dream ever made you think twice about doing something as if it were a warning? These are labeled as precognitive or message dreams. Even if you don't believe in psychic powers, the ancient peoples held fast the idea that dreams contained messages that we should listen to. In Abrahamic religions, dreams are seen as wells of knowledge and insight. They're largely regarded as supernatural in nature by Judaism and Christianity, mostly because of passages in the Bible. For example, in the book of Genesis, the prophet Samuel says, Lie down and sleep in the temple at Shiloh before the ark and receive the word of the Lord. That's pretty much confirmation that dreams were seen as messages from God. In another passage, Jacob has a dream about climbing a ladder to heaven where he and God had a barbecue. Okay, well, there's no grilling of delicious food, but God does give him instructions. A dream ladder is then symbolic of what many religions argue, that dreams are portals to places where we can receive divine information to help us in our lives. These explanations for why we dream continue to resonate with people today, and there are a plethora of books on the subject of precognitive and supernatural dreams and how to interpret them. Even in literature, our concept of why we dream is affected by those ancient ideas. Writers often use dreams to inspire or inform characters through what they call dream vision. H.P. Lovecraft, Philip K. Dick, and Lewis Carroll all use dreams in this way. Even Stephen King has used it several times, almost using dreams as a way to telegraph important information to characters and the reader. His book Bag of Bones is particularly strong on this, as the main character receives supernatural messages and precognitive warnings about what is to come through a series of intense dreams. So these ideas are still profound and present to this day, and who knows if they have any basis in reality, but even science has flirted with the idea that dreams contain messages that we should absorb. 
The first scientific exploration of why we dream came through the fledgling discipline of psychiatry back in the 19th century. Most people have heard of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, two psychiatrists who founded psychoanalysis and analytic psychiatry respectively. While much of their work has been superseded since, they're both incredibly important figures when investigating what dreams are. In the late 1800s, Freud developed his theory that dreams are direct representations of the unconscious mind. This is the part of our mind that we don't normally have access to, but which affects and creates all of our desires and deepest motivations. It's kind of like a trap door into the most hidden secrets of your mind, even ones you keep from yourself, like why you secretly collect BTS and K-pop memorabilia. Freud believed that our dreams can be interpreted so that we can understand aspects of our unconscious. More specifically, he thought dreams were all about the unconscious wish fulfillment. By understanding what our dreams mean, we can therefore understand what we truly want and figure out whether or not that's a healthy desire. And there are always jokes about Freud telling parents to lie back on a leather couch before saying in a thick Austrian accent, tell me about your childhood. But it's kind of true. Freud believed that unconscious desires we have relate directly back to our early experiences in life. These dreams have latent and manifest components. Manifest parts of our dreams are things that literally appear during dreaming. Freud was more interested in the latent aspects of our dreams. These are things in our dreams that represent something much deeper. For example, if you had a dream about meeting dead famous people from centuries ago, Freud might have interpreted this as to really be about the desire to speak with loved ones who have passed away. For many dream researchers, Freud eventually got a little carried away and argued that every latent part of a dream is about unconscious sexual desire, some of it about pretty unhealthy desires about your parents that he believed we all have and ah, oh, listen, let's just move on. But even though many have abandoned Freud's explanation for what dreams are, there are still academics and some researchers who think that he was onto something. Carl Jung was another famous psychiatrist who believed that dreams were important to understanding who we are. He was a contemporary of Freud's and he linked his ideas back to those ancient traditions. For Jung, dreams are all about receiving important messages that can reveal things about our lives and how we should live. Jung argued that dreams should be seen as a part of us crying out to be understood. However, his most important idea about why we dream was that our dreams relate directly to the experience that we've had that day. Our memories of the day leave an imprint on our minds and our dreams are a way to organize and understand those experiences. Carl Jung called these memories day residue, and it's the idea that leads us into the more recent research into why we dream. During the 1960s and 1970s, there were several researchers who began to challenge Freud's views about why we dream. In 1976, two researchers by the names of Alan Hobson and Robert McCarley were looking at a specific phase of sleep. You see, neuroscientists and psychologists have realized this point in our brains emit different signals at different times throughout the night. We go through a specific phase of sleep moving from one onto the next. What Hobson and McCarley realized was that the signals associated with dreaming started during one of these phases, known as REM sleep. This stands for rapid eye movement, and you can actually see when people are in this phase of sleep because their eyes literally rapidly move underneath their eyelids. Though I wouldn't recommend standing over a loved one trying to make this happen. I tried it and well, I gave them quite a fright. Wearing my Michael Myers mask at the same time probably wasn't a good idea. Anyway, during REM sleep, it's as if the brain comes to life and starts to produce vivid internal hallucinations. During this phase, our bodies are immobilized to protect us from acting out our dreams. Well, most of us sleepwalkers, I'm looking at you. Recent research suggests this is made possible by blocking two neurotransmitters, glycine and GABA. This seems to stop our motor neurons from working correctly, at least temporarily. When your body's in this paralyzed state, the muscles relax, and some think that it's when we enter a deep restorative sleep that's necessary for our bodies to heal correctly. Linking back to our good old pal Carl Jung, many scientists also believe that our brains take this opportunity to make sense of our recent experiences and organize them properly. This has been shown to improve problem solving. Have you ever had something that you were trying to figure out in your life and then the next day the solution just sort of appears? Well, this is probably because REM sleep makes information more easily accessible. Kind of like a hard disk defrag. Hopefully without the blue screen of death. 
While most researchers believe dreams have some bearing on making our brains work better the next day and giving us insight into problems in our lives, some now argue that our dreams are what is known as epiphenomena. This means that dreams are a byproduct of our brains working and don't have any real purpose in and of themselves. They're just experiences that don't do anything. In Susan Blackmore's book, Consciousness, an introduction, dreaming is described as a meaningless experience produced by a system designed to think and go to sleep. And that's that. So science is still in a debate about whether dreams have a function or not. However, the story does not end there. There are people who cannot dream, and by studying them, we can gain some insight into whether dreams are important or not. Most dream research focuses on the REM stage of sleep. When you don't get enough good quality sleep, it can significantly impede your well-being. Much of this is attributed to not entering REM sleep for a healthy amount of time each night and therefore not dreaming. But it gets worse. There are people who have been unable to enter REM sleep for long periods. In the beginning, this manifests as heightened anxiety, mood swings, and aggression. Over time, psychological disturbances increase with full-on psychosis sometimes happening. But what's interesting is that when REM sleep is prevented in mice, they no longer have the ability to learn new things at the same rate. The attention span of these animals becomes minimal and they struggle with decision making. In humans, we can even lose the ability to speak properly. This all links back to Carl Jung's idea that our dreams happen when our brains are organizing the events of the day, including learning new things. But can you still enter REM sleep and not dream at the same time? There's a condition known as Charcot-Wilbrand syndrome where this appears to happen. Patients cannot dream, but they do enter REM-like sleep. One symptom of this is that people become more obsessive over a single thing. It's been theorized that this is because dreams help us unlearn useless information and detach from things so that we can focus on what's important. Without that, we obsess over things that aren't helpful. Why are carrots orange? <laughs> From this perspective then, it's not about helping us learn, but helping us filter out useless information. There's also evidence that if you can't dream, you can't regulate your emotions properly. <laughs> so maybe it's that dreams don't just organize information, but process how we feel about the things that happen to us. But whatever the reason for dreaming, I hope you have a restful night this evening filled with relaxing dreams to help blow away any blues in your life. Now excuse me while I go dream about cake. Delicious cake. Good night. Be sure to tune in every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for brand new content from me. And remember to follow me on Discord and Twitch, as well as my team who make these videos possible. You'll find all of their respective links in the description below this video. Thanks for watching.